Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is John Spear, and I'm the director of the Australian Industrial Transformation Institute at Flinders University. And I'd like to welcome you all today to this uh, next in our series of seminars and forums uh, on the future of work in the digital age. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, I'm coming to you from Ghana land, uh, where the uh, Bedford Park and Flinders campuses of uh, Flinders University are based and, and uh, pay my respects to their elders, um, past, present and emerging. Um, it's a, an incredible privilege to be hosting this uh, particular uh, seminar today. I've known John Quiggan for many, many years and worked with him on various projects. So it uh, brings me great pleasure um, to introduce him to you today. And it comes off the back of uh, four other seminars that we've run in over recent months. Um, and uh, you'll be able to uh, view those uh, at uh, our website. And this particular uh, seminar today is being recorded. Um, so uh, you can pass it on to your friends after today uh, as part of uh, a growing body of work that we're doing here at the Australian Industrial Transformation Institute. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Gemma Buell and Andreas Sabula who support me with this uh, seminar series. Um, and we expect to be offering more of these um, to you over coming uh, months um, of this year and into next year. But today, um, uh, as you know, I'm incredibly pleased to welcome Professor John Quiggan um, from the University of Queensland. Um, John is no stranger to uh, my state, South Australia. He uh, came from South Australia uh, and he's a good friend of ours. Uh, he's a professor of economics, so uh, he's a prominent research economist, as many of you would know, uh, and common, commentator on uh, Australian economic policy, and uh, has produced over 2,000 publications, uh, including seven books and uh, over 300 refereed journal articles. So John is uh, one of the, if not the most prolific uh, research economists uh, in Australia. Uh, so we're very, very privileged to have him with us today to share his thoughts on reaching for utopia, what are the opportunities for redistributing work and leisure, strengthening dignity and social justice. A, a really provocative topic at this particular time in our history, given COVID. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I uh, join with you in welcoming um, John Quiggan to present to us today. Welcome, John. Uh, thanks, John. I'll just come briefly on to video, I hope. Nope. Um, I guess here I am. Yeah, so um, always, uh, always a miracle when this little bit of technology works, and we'll just see if the sharing screen, uh, sharing screen works in a moment. So thanks, John. It's um, uh, great to talk to you again, and um, had many happy and very productive visits to South Australia and uh, doing this one virtually, hopefully back in person at some point before too long. So I'll, I'll share my screen. Just while you're doing that, John, I'll just yeah. mention also that, uh, of course, people can uh, uh, enter their questions into the uh, um, to the panel there. And um, uh, so please uh, enter your questions in there and we'll moderate them. And I'll ask questions of John uh, towards the end of his um, presentation. Yeah, and I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the various bits of land we're all meeting on. Uh, the bit behind me is uh, University of Queensland uh, in the um, uh, traditional lands of the uh, Turbul and Yagara people. Uh, I'm actually travelling at the moment, so I'm not quite sure whose land I'm, I'm sitting on, but almost I know it's unceded and that uh, uh, I pay respects to uh, elders past, present and emerging. Uh, so I picked this title, I think um, possibly a slightly uh, provocative one, Um, now, I just need to get myself another slide. Now we should be going. Okay, so uh, uh, yeah, uh, from the University of Queensland, I'm available on all social media. Fortunately, I have an almost unique name. So if you want to find out what I'm up to, uh, go to your preferred medium other than Instagram, I guess, and you'll find me there. So uh, I picked this title, hopefully uh, somewhat provocatively. Uh, utopian thinking has been out of fashion for a long time. A bunch of reasons for that. Uh, the first is very simply that um, uh, utopian thinking is always somewhat inconvenient for uh, the representatives of the established order. As Karl Mannheim, uh, one of the um, one of the really great thinkers, in my opinion, um, uh, said, um, 
the representative of the established order will always um, will always uh, label as utopian all conceptions of existence from which which from their point of view can in principle will never be realized so uh, easy to uh, criticize any proposal for change as, as utopian uh, similarly uh, uh, to treat your own uh, dominant ideology as common sense uh, while decrying the ideological views of anybody who, who would criticize it i think uh, uh, the uh, dismissal of utopianism uh, has uh, a lot to do, of course, with the catastrophic failure of Marxism, uh, a, a theory which was explicitly anti-utopian in its formulation. Marx was very scathing about uh, about utopians and said almost nothing about the kind of society that uh, uh, the hope would emerge from a proletarian revolution. Uh, but there's no doubt that the uh, no doubt that the people who followed Marxist uh, uh, Marxist views to the point of achieving achieving elite power uh, produced some pretty hideous dystopias. Also, maybe fading a bit, but uh, certainly for quite a number of years, uh, the fashionable thinking on the left was uh, uh, was dominated by a set of ideas we can call postmodernism, uh, a critique of grand narratives uh, of all kinds, um, mostly mostly directed indeed at recovering Stalinists, um, uh, a critique which. Um, uh, in all sorts of ways led to paralysis. I, I read a description looking looking about this question of uh, that it ended up as being an odd kind of introspective conservatism. You demonstrate with critique that every possible narrative is equally false. Well, uh, of course, the uh, easily available one is the one being promoted by the representative of the established order day in and day out. That's the one that uh, typically succeeds. So, um, I've talked about utopia, but the other thing we need to be aware of is that we are currently, uh, it's currently not a choice between dis utopia and something um, acceptable, but rather between uh, utopia and dystopia. Uh, for those who read the book of Revelations, um, the uh, four horsemen of the apocalypse, war, pestilence, fam pestilence famine and death, uh, all of these, uh, all of these uh, present with us uh, at this moment, uh, in ways that uh, I think most of us thought could never possibly happen. Uh, we've uh, seen in particular uh, yeah, the, uh, the climate catastrophe that's been building for uh, for 30 years at least, uh, you know, been recognised for 30 years, and which uh, the world makes fitful attempts to deal with, but which Australia in particular has, has signally failed to address. Uh, generally speaking, although... Um, Although not, uh, although there have been a mixture of events in the pandemic, it's fair to say as a society uh, we haven't handled it well. And indeed, uh, as I wrote in the monthly a while ago, if we had had uh, today uh, the national government we had of the 1970s, uh, uh, we certainly wouldn't have seen, I think, uh, uh, the weakness with which the uh, which the pandemic has addressed the. Uh, abandonment of national responsibility handling over the states and, and the state's incapacity to come uh, to come to a coherent and consistent policy. Uh, inequality and poverty uh, leading uh, uh, leading to um, uh, of course uh, continued world hunger and then that famine uh, exacerbated by the war uh, the war in Ukraine and um, and uh, reflected in so-called deaths of despair but even before the uh, before the COVID pandemic, life expectancy in the United States was falling, uh, and the typical experience of the last 40 or 50 years has been that where the US leads uh, downwards in most respects, the rest of the world will, will eventually follow. So uh, in this context, I think the idea of just muddling through uh, this classic alternative to utopianism uh, doesn't seem nearly as appealing as it might have done. Well, what's needed, we need, I think, a vision of a radically better future. Uh, there's so many aspects to this that um, I can't possibly cover in a talk, but I'm an economist, so I'm going to talk about uh, primarily about issues relating to work and economic well-being. Uh, work is, after all, uh, central to the lives of, of most people in most places, uh, and um, according as, it's, uh, uh, as it is uh, rewarding, uh, well paid or not, uh, and secure, uh, that makes a huge difference to all aspects of our well-being. Uh, I'll talk a bit about uh, 
options for economic well-being that don't involve paid work, but I think almost any notion of uh, almost any notion of utopia uh, centres around work in one form or another. So I want to um, I want to uh, start with a historical perspective. I think uh, uh, we tend to live a lot lot in the present, but if we're to think about uh, something beyond the day-to-day uh, -day concerns of, of what bill might make it through the parliament, who's going to be elected at the next election and so forth. Uh, we need not only to look further into the future than we normally do, but also, uh, also look at the past, analyse the breakdown of what seemed like a, a path to a prosperous future 40 or 50 years ago, uh, seemed in a different way to aim to produce a different kind of prosperity, I guess, uh, around the turn of this century, and now clearly is doing neither. Uh, and then to look at a new vision of the future and a little bit, only a tiny bit about political strategy that we might do to achieve this. So um, in, in any story of a positive view of utopia, uh, I think the crucial event, uh, the, cru the crucial starting point is the rise of, of social democracy uh, from the late 19th century to the 1970s. Uh, social democracy, uh, comes out of the socialist movement. Uh, uh, we see a break with, uh, uh, with the forms of Marxism that led, led to communism uh, and the development of, uh, development of a state which, uh, broadly speaking, is democratic, supported by the majority of the public and acting in the interests of the majority of people rather than acting in the interests of a ruling class and socially uh, based on a vision uh, that we're all in this together, that, uh, that our shared prosperity is what matters rather than an, an individual search to do better at the expense of others. Uh, as I say, that seemed for the best part of 100 years like an unstoppable trend. Uh, things seem to be on a path towards getting steadily, steadily better. Uh, that came to a fairly sudden halt in the 1970s, and we saw the revival of what are various, variously called uh, market liberalism or neoliberalism. Uh, uh, ideas which uh, had seemingly been refuted by the success of social democracy were uh, raised again, failed again with the global financial crisis, uh, but nonetheless have, have continued to haunt us. And a reference to zombie economics, my uh, book on this subject, which was based on the GFC, uh, looking at the ways in which these ideas have been born, developed, been killed by the ugly facts of experience, but nonetheless returned to haunt us in zombie form. I won't talk too much about that. I want more to look at uh, options for the future. So um, first, the social democratic moment, really from uh, 1945, uh, uh, the end of the hot phase of the Great European War, which began really in 1914, uh, faded away a little bit, uh, after the armistice in 1918, resumed in 1939, uh, came again, and finally, uh, finally, that phase of it at least ended in 1945 uh, with the defeat of Hitler. And um, in between, of course, the the, uh, the first and second uh, world wars, uh, the failure of, of capitalism, uh, particularly the Great Depression, uh, leading to a widespread consensus that. Uh, uh, that we need to make a better world and that we need to break with the dogmas of the past. Uh, what were the features of this uh, moment? Well, first, uh, Keynesian macroeconomic stabilisation effectively eliminated unemployment. I was uh, uh, looking at uh, proposals for the uh, uh, Jobs and Skills Summit to be held in September and suggested, well, possibly um, uh, commit it, the government could commit itself to full employment. That would be certainly uh, something striking to come out of the summit. Uh, Mr. Chalmers actually did say something that could be passed that way, so, so I won't give up hope on that. Uh, having mentioned uh, that uh, unemployment below 3% would be a good idea, one of my commenters pointed out that uh, the average rate of unemployment between 1941 and the early 1970s was 1.9%. And certainly I can remember rates above 2% being regarded as a very bad news for the government of the day. Uh, the welfare state, uh, a widespread, uh, a comprehensive net of protections which emerged around the turn of the 20th century with things like old age pensions, uh, workers' compensation and so forth, uh, and became uh, an attempt uh, to protect people against 
the many hazards which life in a capitalist economy uh, throws at them, unemployment, sickness, uh, disability in old age, uh, as, well as, to, uh, as well as to help families bring up children and so forth. Expand access to education and health services. Uh, so we go from, go from, at the beginning of this period, uh, a um, situation where most children, certainly most children of the working class, could be expected to get the uh, minimal school education, leaving school at, at 14, year 10, uh, if they're lucky, perhaps getting an apprenticeship, but otherwise entering the workforce. Uh, and that was really uh, that was really the expected outcome uh, to a situation where, uh, as we approach the end of this period, uh, anybody or anybody could reasonably aspire uh, to a university education or to post school education uh, in forms like TAFE and, and so forth. Uh, similarly, health services are making the transition from essentially a for-profit service provided with a char charity on the side for the poor uh, to a, a universal human right. Broadly shared prosperity, this was really the only period in the history of, uh, certainly uh, not only in the history of capitalism, but really uh, in the history of times in which notions like wealth inequality made sense, uh, when we seem to have something uh, where the vast majority of people uh, lived on more or less the same standard of living uh, with only a handful of people uh, doing a bit better and uh, not massively better and another handful missing out at the bottom. The uh, picture of, uh, the picture of, uh, that was in sociology books at the time, saw the bad old days of a pyramid with a tiny apex at the top getting most uh, to a distribution that was visualized as an onion with a vast middle class uh, and a small and relatively unimportant uh, upper and lower class, and that was certainly um, uh, certainly the lived experience of those times. And of course, we're now well and truly back with the uh, uh, back with the pyramid, a uh, period when wages increased steadily, uh, but nonetheless we saw shorter working hours, uh, strong unions um, which could um, uh, protect workers against exploitation in various ways, and also importantly, because I mean certainly at the beginning of this period, this was uh, uh, primarily a um, uh, primarily a benefit that went to uh, went to working men, uh, white working men typically. Uh, what we saw was that the um, uh, that this gave rise to the civil rights movement, movements for indigenous uh, indigenous and black rights in the U.S., uh, environmental movements, feminism and, and gay rights. All of these things were products of that social democratic moment. Some of them have some of those projects have been all those projects have been pursued since then. Uh, with greater or less success, but I'd argue with a good deal less success than uh, we would have hoped for. Uh, we would have hoped for uh, looking at the world around about 1970 when I first came to political consciousness. Uh, the idea that we would be where we are now in 50 years' time, uh, certainly in economic policy, of course, would have been unbelievably bad. But uh, uh, but even in terms of these other issues, which which. Uh, took longer to emerge, uh, we've seen very powerful resistance on most of them. And, and that, of course, is uh, becoming more and more so uh, as we see, for example, developments in the US, but also, also in other countries uh, pushing back against those advances that have been made. So the future we didn't have. Um, well, first, um, uh, if, you know, if we looked at the future as it seemed likely to be at, at the end of that period, around about 1970, uh, certainly, we would have expected an end to poverty. Uh, LBJ declared war on poverty in in the uh, in the US, uh, and if, every expectation was that, given the uh, technical technocratic skills of the US state and the massive, unprecedented abundance of technological power, uh, that this would surely be be achieved. Uh, and similar assumptions were being made uh, in all the. Um, in all the uh, developed countries, and with an expectation that this would this would spread further, the uh, the part of the world that we would consider developed had already spread from a few countries in Western Europe, plus Australia and New Zealand, uh, to most of Europe, uh, Japan. We're already seeing the emergence of um, emergence of rapid economic growth in parts of Asia. Uh, so the expectation was that uh, uh, that the remaining pockets of poverty would soon be eliminated. Uh, of course, that didn't happen. Um, uh, Ronald Reagan famously said we made war on poverty and poverty won. What's more accurate, and Reagan played a large part, is 
uh, the government made war on poverty and then changed sides and the election of uh, the election of Reagan himself being being a pretty clear indicator of that. Uh, we also saw early discussions of, of guaranteed minimum income, uh, particularly in the US, but not only in the US. Um, uh, continued reductions in working hours over this period, uh, the beginning of the period we saw uh, the arrival of the weekend, we take it for granted, but actually it's uh, it arrived within living memory that the, the uh, five day week Australia Australia uh, reached that in 1948. Uh, since then we've had uh, during this period we had uh, expansions of um, expansions of annual leave, a provision of long service leave, uh, better provisions for retirement and so forth. And indeed when people worried about the future and worried about uh, working time, what they worried about was, well, what are we going to do with all this free time? You could meet Barry Jones had a book called Sleepers Wake, which addressed this issue. There was a, a, bun a bunch of issues of this kind of, of uh, are we just going to spend all of this marvellous free time we have just sitting on the couch watching TV? Uh, what, what is to be done here? And um, uh, this kind of thinking has emerged in anticipation, but in a much more dystopian fashion of, or how we manage a society where only 50% of people have jobs and the other 50% have been displaced by technology. Uh, that's sort of a, a, um, a dystopian version of the idea of the end of work. Uh, the idea of industrial democracy was, was big. We had strong unions, uh, but in a very adversarial relationship uh, with, uh, with employers, even though clearly... Um, Clearly, in a capitalist society, employers and unions have a great deal of common interest. Uh, the idea that we could move away from um, uh, the idea that we could move away from owners of capital running the show and and uh, and labour uh, resisting unfair impositions uh, to something more cooperative uh, seemed like a promising idea. Uh, the um, Swedes, for example, had the Meidner plan, which would have seen uh, gradual. Uh, employee ownership or a large share of employee ownership of, of major enterprises. A similar idea has been developed in, in Germany. The general point being uh, that um, uh, in its raw form, uh, the employment relationship goes back to the law of master and servant, uh, as it implies uh, an essentially oppressive relationship uh, trimmed away, re regulated by law, uh, protected by unions to some extent, uh, but, but still one in which uh, you go to work to be ordered around by other people. Uh, environmental sustainability first emerging at this time uh, as a concern, the first Earth Day and so forth, uh, and a feeling that um, uh, equality would continue, uh, that the inequalities that are remaining would be um, uh, would be gradually smoothed out. Uh, there's an idea of called Kuznets Law, which uh, predicated that uh, at the beginning of capitalist development, uh, the Industrial Revolution, we'd see a big increase in inequality with big fortunes being made, uh, but that over time and given a democratic society, these would these inequalities would inevitably be uh, uh, be reduced uh, to something much more approaching uh, a complete equality of, of outcome. Uh, certainly, with uh, once we allow for choices people make as to how much they wish to want to work and so forth, that was the kind of vision of the future, I guess that. Um, uh, uh, in Australia, seemed to be on the uh, on the horizon when the Whitlam government was elected in 1972. Uh, we all, some of us, remember, and anybody with any historical awareness knows how that turned out. Uh, and and we've been dealing with the consequences for the subsequent 50 years or so. So, uh, market liberalism, uh, dominant ideology from the 1970s onwards. Uh, variously called neoliberalism, economic rationalism, uh, the Washington Consensus, that name seems to have gone out a bit, I guess, but I sometimes use neoliberalism and sometimes not. Uh, uh, always problematic with a pejorative term that gets attached to all sorts of things, anything the speaker doesn't like, uh, but there is a real, it's nonetheless not a meaningless slur any more than the fact that people use democracy to describe anything they like means that democracy is not meaningful. Uh, so, um, key elements, a um, uh, crucial idea was to roll back the state, um, uh, abandon the use of Keynesian uh, policies to um, man maintain the economy, instead rely on, on monetary policy, rely on uh, central banks like the Reserve Bank to run the economy for us, uh, privatisation, get governments out of the business of producing and providing goods and services, 
uh, and a central role for financial markets. The general idea was that uh, uh, financial markets, highly paid professionals, will do a far better job of working out what are good investments and what are bad investments uh, than government bureaucrats can do, and that all the governments need to do is, uh, is uh, get out of the way, ensure that uh, uh, if they remove distortions that change prices, and then let markets do the job of deciding what we should produce and, and distribute and what we shouldn't. Now, why is it neo, if it's neoliberalism, why? Well, because it, it, this idea still had, at least initially, to compete with social democracy. Uh, they couldn't go back to... Uh, uh, couldn't go back to the Great Depression or to the 19th century in terms of uh, uh, poverty and pauperism. They had to claim that uh, that this could nonetheless deliver the kinds of financial security, uh, broadly speaking, that social democracy had done through the welfare state. Uh, importantly, I mean, the term liberalism covers a bunch of things. Uh, uh, in some contexts, it's mainly about things like free speech and human rights. Um, market liberalism or neoliberalism uh, wasn't much concerned with that and, and, and isn't. Uh, it's uh, consistent with a whole range of views on those issues. Uh, uh, I've sometimes divided them into hard neoliberalism, uh, the Thatcher, uh, Reagan kind of thing, which is definitely hostile to uh, lots of notions of, of civil liberties uh, and soft neoliberalism of the kind typically offered by Labour and social democratic parties that have capitulated. Uh, which tries to preserve some of these things. But essentially, uh, the core of this is, is reliance on markets and financial markets in particular. Uh, the other aspects of classical liberalism are, are really um, optional add-ons. So um, failure of market liberalism, well, what's striking, you know, I've described 30 years in which, um, in which social democracy was startlingly successful, um, uh, by far the most prosperous that the developed world had, had ever experienced, uh, and um, a relatively rapid failure over a period of four or five years. When we look at market liberalism, there was really only a decade or so when everything seemed to be going well. If you go back to the 1990s, uh, uh, US stock markets were booming, unemployment was falling, uh, lots of triumphalist books. Um, the pop version of this would probably be... Uh, uh, Tom Friedman's The Lexus and the Olive Tree, but, but many others uh, making the point we have this huge prosperity and it's going to continue indefinitely in the future. Uh, that started breaking down around the turn of this century. We had a, an outburst of speculation in so-called dot-com stocks, uh, which, which fell in a dreadful heap, uh, but things seemed to be pumped back to life before the global financial crisis in 2008. Uh, uh, financial crisis... Uh, unlike, uh, certainly unlike the pandemic, generated entirely within the financial system, which was supposed to be providing us with, uh, with economic stability and, and prosperity, uh, apply, appeared in the US, the UK and beyond, uh, and uh, for a period appeared to presage, raise the threat of the complete collapse of the global economic system. Uh, rescued by a brief return to Keynesian stimulus, government spent big, and then were pilloried for it by, by uh, various commentators. Uh, uh, briefly, bank, nationalised banks then handed them back to their owners uh, uh, to make even more money and commit even more uh, crimes of various kinds uh, and bailouts. Uh, despite the... So, and this, at this point, this was my... Uh, uh, when I wrote my zombie economics books, what we saw was, and still do to some extent, a return to the formulas of, of neoliberalism. People didn't suddenly think through and come up with anything, uh, anything concrete, uh, but it no longer carried conviction. Uh, for, the, um, uh, for the voters who'd previously supported hardline versions of market liberalism and, and to some extent accepted rhetoric about free markets, uh, they were uh, gradually seduced by, uh, by various... Uh, uh, various mountebanks of the type of, of Trump, Johnson, uh, Scott Morrison, people who clearly didn't think at all about uh, notions of, of the efficiency of the market or anything of that kind, uh, just fed the prejudices of, of, the, uh, of the right and did favours for, favors for big business or for businesses, uh, provided, of course, they were favourable to the government of the day. So, so essentially, crony capitalism was their policy. 
Uh, but uh, still with a vague idea that, uh, that these formulas of market liberalism uh, were, the, were the right way to think about things. Uh, the alternative, what I've called soft neoliberalism, uh, it used to be called the third way back in the day, uh, an idea of doing much the same things, continuing with privatization, trying to scale back uh, uh, the, the level of public expenditure, uh, but to soften it up, uh, soften it up with uh, better social welfare and also to be socially progressive on, on issues like equal marriage and so forth. Uh, the Clintons, both Bill and Hillary, uh, exemplified this. Um, Tony Blair in the US, and I think um, uh, although Labor has made had made some attempts here to a break away from that very much uh, the tenor of the Albanese government so far uh, has been this kind of soft neoliberalism so we're already hearing hearing talk about uh, budget repair and, and the kinds of formula that we typically uh, typically get with uh, with this idea an idea which is pretty comprehensively failed in my view so um uh, I'll skip over we, between the GFC and, and the pandemic. We had 10 years in which, uh, in which uh, capitalist economies were operating more or less uh, uh, under emergency conditions. That is, uh, uh, central banks tried to get back to uh, the way they'd managed things with interest rate adjustments, but that didn't work. Interest rates pushed towards zero. Uh, unemployment having risen high, uh, particularly in countries that returned to austerity after the GFC, uh, very gradually creeping downwards. Uh, just when it seemed that this might work, uh, we got the pandemic, uh, a disaster, and one which uh, you know, I, um, uh, whenever I write something on the uh, on the pandemic, uh, if I ever start referring to the past tense, immediately cross that down and say the pandemic restriction period. What we have now is the unrestricted pandemic uh, being allowed to. Uh, uh, sweep the population uh, uh, with no control at all. Uh, uh, our own chief health officer took office by saying uh, COVID will spread as it must. He, I, he appeared to indicate a belief in uh, that having had COVID once you were immune, which um, even then seemed a hopelessly no position. But in any case, we have this pandemic. Uh, it's uh, still continuing. It's exposed lots of weaknesses in the uh, modern state, some unexpected strengths, and it's revealed unexpected possibilities. In the Australian context, uh, but not only in Australia, a startling loss of nation state capacity. As I've said, if an emergency like this had happened uh, under Whitlam or Hawke or Howard, uh, the idea that the Prime Minister would have said, well, most of these things are really state government responsibilities, and I'm, I don't really think we ought to be doing anything very much about this, uh, would have been laughable. Uh, any of those leaders, or, and indeed uh, their predecessors going back to Menzies, would have, uh, uh, would have taken charge of the situation, would have used the great powers of the Commonwealth uh, to drive, drive a uniform national policy uh, rather than this ad hoc patchwork that we got, uh, got as a response. Um, and almost certainly, uh, uh, almost certainly a policy that uh, uh, didn't display the kind of uh, uh, switch from a uh, hardline lockdown to complete collapse that we've seen uh, in Australia. Uh, important point, a success yet again of expansionary fiscal policy. It's seen highly likely that the, um, uh, that the pandemic uh, and the restrictions required to prevent it from you know, either way, whether we had the restrictions or not, uh, seems certain that uh, uh, the economy was going to collapse in, in 2020. It didn't, thanks to... Uh, uh, thanks for expansionary fiscal policy. We're still mopping up the consequence of that in various ways, but uh, show once again that the basics of Keynesian macro work. Uh, and finally, the unexpected possibilities, working from home, uh, uh, startlingly successful. Uh, I've always been an enthusiast for remote stuff, even if the technology occasionally gives me grief. Uh, but if somebody had said, well, look, we are going to test out your ideas, uh, we just call everybody up on Saturday and say, don't come to the office on Monday. Uh, you'll just have to do your work from home from now on. Uh, and by the way, you'll be teaching the kids. Uh, the expectation would have been, I think, that the vast majority of economic processes would grind to a halt pretty fast. Uh, in fact, it happened almost without a hitch. Uh, remote learning, not so much, perhaps. It's certainly, um, uh, certainly uh, uh, lots of difficulties emerged, but, uh, but also lot, lots of possibilities. So that um, 
Uh, so the extent to which we could do things which uh, had been technically possible for a long time, uh, but for which we lacked the uh, uh, lacked the uh, set of social conventions needed to make it work was uh, a great one. Uh, telehealth, uh, which apparently uh, apparently is to be shut down very shortly or has been uh, a hugely successful way of reducing the burden on the healthcare system of managing the task of delivering health uh, during a pandemic. Uh, but apparently we, we, this is to be uh, uh, abolished now. New ways of providing all kinds of services so that um, uh, all kinds of home delivery and, uh, and other activities that, again, had always been technically, had long been technically possible, uh, suddenly, became, uh, suddenly became options that um, uh, potentially could lead to quite substantial increases in productivity. So now some... Uh, where are we now? Well, in my view, uh, uh, we are in a situation where we don't have uh, an option of going back to uh, when it was normal, whenever that was, really quite a long time ago. The, uh, even before the pandemic, as I say, the economy was operating under emergency conditions, the economic policies that had been uh, uh, of um, control of the economy by monetary policy were failing. Uh, inequality was growing and so forth. Uh, the idea that we should say, look, just hold tight and muddle through, I think, uh, is not going to be successful. Uh, it's going indeed to be reflected in continuing advances of, of the dystopian uh, the dystopian right, as we've seen um, emerging in many different countries. Uh, we need to offer a, um, a more uh, radical to vision of a better life. And I've just listed a few, uh, a few possibilities. Uh, most of which I'm involved in some kind of effort to, to promote. So I suppose plugging my own utopian corner here. So first up, uh, the four day week, as I said, the long-term trend towards more free time um, ended in the 1980s. Uh, so at the beginning it started, uh, a huge achievement of the mid 19th century was to get an eight hour working day, but with a six day week, so 48 hours a week. First achieved in Australia and New Zealand, as with Pavlovas and many other things, it does look as if the New Zealanders actually got there first, but um, uh, uh, certainly we were, we were, uh, we were there uh, right at the beginning. Uh, the weekend in 1948, uh, finally, the last significant one, the, the 38-hour week, achieved in the 1980s, a time when the ACTU was campaigning for the 35-hour week, a, um, a campaign which is still on its books as, as an objective, but hasn't been seen much of. So we've had huge increases in productivity since the um, uh, since the 1980s, uh, but no change in standard working hours. Uh, not as far as I can see, because people are are keen to work these hours. Uh, it's because bosses want them to work, work long hours. Bosses, as we've seen during the pandemic, love the idea that people will come into work in the CBD under their eyes, uh, uh, continuously suggesting that it's far better that we should come in, and get sick, and die. Uh, then that we should stay home and and not uh, and and not uh, have a humming office and and a busy CBD, and so it's very clearly I think uh, the pressure from employers uh, continuously for a longer standard working working week that that's driven this. Uh, work life balance has been a chronic problem. Uh, even the point again where John Howard described it as a barbecue stopper twenty or twenty five years ago, We've had some that was I think the peak of work intensification after the. Session. We've had some success in pushing that back, uh, but it remains a chronic problem. And we are now seeing um, a bunch of trials of the four-day week uh, at a company level. Uh, we, we aren't seeing any action on this uh, uh, at the government level, but we are seeing a bunch of a bunch of companies uh, trialling options. Uh, hopefully, the um, uh, the benefits in terms of morale, employee retention, and increased productivity in time on the job uh, will make this. Uh, and make this a worthwhile experiment in some places. So a jobs guarantee, full employment was the central achievement of the social democratic moment. Without full employment, from full employment, everything else followed. Workers weren't free of, uh, uh, free from the fear of chronic unemployment, largely so. Uh, if you didn't like your boss in the 1960s, you could walk out, walk down the street and there'll be another job going. That's an oversimplification, but there was certainly then and most recently now, the only time, times 50 years apart when 
uh, there were more listed vacancies than there were unemployed workers to fill them. Crucially, it freed governments from dependence on business competence. If governments wanted to do something uh, and the business council or its predecessors said, well, we don't like this, um, they couldn't say, well, and if you do this, we'll stop investing and there'll be unemployment. Governments had confidence that they could maintain full employment uh, and therefore crucial to receiving reductions in inequality. We didn't need to uh, allow CEOs to make huge, huge uh, salaries for fear that uh, uh, the enterprise they run might lay people off. So we're finally um, post-pandemic return to unemployment levels comparable to the social democratic era, uh, largely again through Keynesian pandemic policy. Uh, interesting unemployment, while very low, has not been low enough to drive increased wages. Uh, so I conclude uh, that um, indeed it would be both realistic and desirable for the government to commit to a full employment target at the uh, at the forthcoming job summit and uh, pursue policies that uh, achieve that goal, if necessary, uh, directing the Reserve Bank to. Uh, uh, to negotiate an agreement in which full employment was an explicit target of, of policy. Universal basic income, not my favourite term for this. Um, it's an idea that's been around as time has come. Uh, as it described, it describes the simplest but least, least feasible version, uh, giving everyone money that on that money alone they can um, uh, they can live above the poverty line, uh, then recouping it, uh, recouping it through taxation. A bunch of complexities here, but uh, uh, because of the way in which um, tax and um, uh, because we levy taxes mostly on an individual and company basis, uh, uh, this it's uh, the process will involve a lot of churn uh, and tax rates, which which are simply uh, uh, so high that they exceed the likely maximum, a likely point at which which revenue starts to, starts to decline. What could we do with current resources? I and um, I and uh, at least Klein and uh, Tim Dunlop and some other people have proposed the idea of a livable income guarantee. Uh, begin by raising all benefits equal to the old age pension. Uh, a radical step by current standards, but what was the situation that prevailed until 1993 when the Keating government uh, failed to pass on uh, uh, failed to pass on an increase to, un uh, to unemployment benefits? beneficiaries. No, but I think expected at that time that there would never be another increase in, in real uh, in real value of unemployment benefits for 30 odd years, but that is indeed what happened. Uh, but also expanding eligibility uh, for this payment beyond uh, the kind of punitive job search model we have to activities including uh, study, volunteering and creative work. Uh, doing the numbers on this using a micro simulation model, uh, you'd need a top marginal tax rate of 65%, which is um, about what prevailed in the 1970s. Another way of looking at it is it's about three times as expensive as the statutory tax cuts we're going to uh, uh, we're going to uh, uh, be delivered by the current government, uh, implemented by a bipartisan vote of, of the previous government, and then opposition. Uh, so uh, simply by eliminating that, and squeezing up other bunch of other concessions, we could probably uh, get a fair way to the cost of, of delivering uh, delivering this outcome. So while it's utopian, it's utopian in the sense of, of a feasible utopian, not in the sense of, of dreamland. Uh, I just mentioned I've focused mainly on the developed countries, but we could easily, uh, and the world has long been able to end global poverty. Uh, again, uh, a um, a universal income basis might be uh, trying to uh, might be one way of approaching this if we could sell the idea domestically. Uh, the sustainable development goals of the UN include ending poverty, hunger, good health, well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water, energy, and climate action. Simply goals which the estimated annual cost is three trillion. Well, three trillion, I guess, is a lot of money, but um, it's about three percent of the world's total. So, so the fact that we uh, tolerate continued global poverty uh, is a choice, not a, not a necessity. So as I say, um, in terms of the politics of this, uh, there isn't, in my view, a sustainable middle way. The neoliberal consensus that we've had for uh, since the 1970s, where you have two major parties or groupings offering different versions of the same package, uh, more as a hard line and a soft line version of the same uh, market oriented package that's breaking down we're seeing the breakdown of the two-party system in australia and i think uh, 
uh, lightly unless things change to see an even sharper breakdown, that breakdown accelerating um, in, the, um, uh, in the near future. And we're seeing around the world, the mainstream right collapsing into a dystopian uh, Trumpism. The Republican Party in the US completely so. Uh, we're seeing, I think, uh, uh, that tendency within the liberal and national parties uh, strengthening as a result of, of the uh, losses they took in the most recent election. Rather than concluding that something went wrong, they just concluded all we have to do is, uh, is pump harder uh, the same ideas which we, we try to soft pedal in, in the election and the votes will flow. Um, the alternative which we're seeing uh, from the current government, cautious managerialism, uh, make sure things are a little bit better than they were in the previous government, and hope that maybe in two or three terms uh, we could be quite a bit better. I don't think that's going to be a powerful enough alternative to, to stave off that kind of breakdown. In my view, a utopian vision of the future uh, with a plan to at least partially realise that uh, is the essential way forward. So thanks very much for that. Uh, I'll um, uh, be happy to have questions and discussion. Thanks so much, John. Uh, very much appreciated, uh, and uh, lots and lots of food for thought. And uh, um, and I'm I'm sort of drawn immediately to thinking about the the nexus between some of the proposals you make uh, and and the great challenge of our times, as often called um, uh, decarbonisation of the economy, mm -hmm. decarbonisation um, of all that we do. Um, and I, I, th I think probably in part that's motivated your um, and, yeah. and, and energised you. And I just wanted, I wondered if you could just draw out what you think are the likely benefits that might flow from, you know, so the adoption of such policies yeah. and their flow on to the environment. Sure. And indeed, I, I just cut out my slide. I had a slide on that and thought, no, yeah. there's just not enough time. Oh. Well, the first thing is, of course, that um, uh, the more we move away from a notion that, um, uh, that uh, what we want is, uh, economic growth and economic growth means uh, more of everything, more through more extracting materials, more processing them, more delivery of goods and more labor going, more jobs, uh, more jobs with more hours. Uh, uh, the, uh, the greater the prospect of reducing our impact on the, on the planet as a whole. Uh, so, um, uh, so that's, I think, the um, uh, one part of it is just saying that if we are focused on taking more of the benefits of technological progress uh, as free time of various kinds, uh, to spend with family or on whatever projects we want to pursue, uh, that would, um, of course, ease the process of, of transition. Uh, I think also, though, um, uh, a reassertion of, of state capacity is needed. So, so we had Mr Albanese talking about Australia should become... Uh, an energy superpower and all sorts of very nice things like that. And to be fair to the government, they have proposed um, have proposed a reasonably substantial investment in electricity transmission, which would assist that. Uh, but clearly, again, um, the governments of the 20th century would have said, uh, and we're going to become an energy superpower uh, by building these publicly owned uh, facilities, which will, will drive that. And as uh, Going back to, of course, our glory days that we we celebrated the play for government uh, <laughs> and mean and conservative government in all sorts of ways, but one that really delivered the goods in terms of uh, uh, in terms of of, uh, of electricity. So, um, uh, so I think we would see much more emphasis on um, on uh, direct public investment. We see, of course, creeping back um, uh, creeping back in every in every state, you know, the, uh, South Australia with big battery and so forth. Uh, uh, but and even uh, the last government with uh, Snowy 2.0 uh, recognising we really need to get get back to these things. So so I think the combination of um, uh, uh, and again I think uh, recognising that on the whole the attempt to use market processes and financial markets to deliver uh, electricity has been a pretty comprehensive failure. Mm. Um John, uh, is it um, more necessity uh, than utopian to think these things? Well, I think I think as I say, I don't I don't think I don't think there's a successful there's I don't think the path of saying look just just wait patiently and good things will come is nearly as convincing now uh, as it might have been, and certainly the idea of um, 
uh, the idea that um, look, uh, we might, you know, if as I to channel Paul Keating, we might need all this stuff in the twentieth century, but now we have all these marvelous financial markets like Lazette Frères or whoever he works for now, they would deliver this, this prosperity. Really, the, the three, the crisis of the dot-com era, then the GFC, but now the craziness going on with, with cryptocurrencies and things like this just tells us uh, Keynes was 100% right when he said you know, the idea of making the investment plan in the nation the byproduct of a casino uh, is, uh, is just nonsense. That uh, very clearly... Um, uh, that that alternative that that prosper, that prosperous alternative isn't there, and the idea of just creeping along, uh, I think, uh, raises the risk uh, that a Trump or a, uh, a Johnson will come along and and overturn everything. Mm. And and talking about sort of how we compare internationally, of course, a lot of other nations are, are having to entertain them. Um, and or are pursuing a decarbonisation uh, mm. strategy that's much more aggressive than, than we are at the moment. Um, and uh, so, you know, what might be the advantages of us in a geopolitical sense if we were to adopt some of the strategies that you're um, proposing? Well, clearly, I mean, clearly, I think um, uh, yeah, we're, we're going to, we're always in fact seeing this. Um, I was looking at, uh, uh, the Twitter outcomes of the um, uh, latest South Pacific uh, thing. And of course, uh, lots of cheery stuff about how we're going to do great stuff. But uh, the Prime Minister of Fiji is saying, uh, yes, but we actually would like you to do something. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the government's, of course, uh, has a low bar to clear in many respects, but foreign policy more than, more than most, mm. uh, having lots of easy successes. Uh, but yes, the EU trade, free trade agreement, the South Pacific, uh, once, once it becomes clear that the government really has no policy uh, or no policy outside a couple of very limited initiatives uh, that, and, and no real way of extending past those, uh, you know, past that, yeah, we can get to 43% doubtless, but mm. there's no policy to get us to zero. Mm. Um, um, so that that I think will be um, uh, will start to have have its consequences. Uh, who knows whether that will matter? They've, they've locked themselves in in fairly thoroughly, but uh, we just have to have to see. Some of our, some of the questions and comments yeah. that are coming through are, are interesting, and uh, uh, some relating to you know, generational sort of influences yeah. on the way in which this might unfold. John, I mean, you and I are, are uh, not as young as we used to be, but um, any reflections on? No, I do. Uh, <laughs> um, any yeah. reflections? Yeah, on... I must. Say, I must say, I don't. Yeah, I don't really buy intergenerational stories. The real story is intergeneration mm. is intergenerational transmission of inequality. Mm. Uh, the world is just as good for a 20 year old graduate of a private school uh, with a house on the way from the bank of mum and dad mm. as it ever was. Um, uh, what, you know, what matters, you know, old fashioned, but what matters is, is class. Mm. You know, I, mean, I mean, the basic fact is, of course, uh, it's certainly true that a huge amount of, of real estate wealth has ended up in the hands of, uh, of, uh, the generation of people who got in before prices rose, uh, but those people are going to die, we're going to die, and the houses will still be there. And the houses will be owned, broadly speaking, by the uh, by the children of the people who, who own them now. Uh, so, so my concern is much more about uh, uh, the closing off of, of, the, uh, of the equality of opportunity which emerged in the social democratic period. That uh, social democratic period we had much more access for it, increasing access for everybody. And because the prizes were relatively equal, uh, each each generation had to pretty much make it for themselves. You couldn't, you know, even if even if you had done uh, pretty well for yourself in the you know, 60s and 70s, uh, you couldn't really set your kids up for life. Now we see we see uh, the emergence, I think, of, of entrenched multi-generational inequality as, as the likely outcome. John, I mean, this is not the only period in history where, um, you know, questions of existence um, have um, played on our minds, you know, existential threat. Um, but, um, but, but it, it is a unique period in many different, in many different ways. Um, out of this, what, 
you know, what can you see emerging from the point of view of new political movements or movements for change which might uh, impact on political strategy? Yeah. Well, I think we're already seeing, as I, I have put this as the three-party model, we, we have seen, particularly in countries set up for a two-party system like Australia and, uh, and the US, essentially the two a long period when the two major parties were uh, more or less agreed on softer or harder line versions of the same story, privatisation, uh, uh, deregulation and so forth. And indeed, before that, of a, you know, a broad consensus on social democracy, we didn't through that post-social democratic period, have conservative parties actively struggling against it. They just tend to slow things down. You know, Menzies was in power for most of the period I'm talking about. Uh, most of the big social, many of the big social advances uh, were achieved. Uh, under, uh, under that period, Whitlam came in and finished the job very rapidly in terms of delivering those achievements, much of which survived the subsequent period. That's gone. What we're now seeing, as I say, is uh, uh, immediately, you know, that, a lot of that on the conservative side relied on pandering to the prejudices of, of, uh, of a group of people, uh, you know, various groups of people who saw themselves as, have, as be, being members of the rightfully dominant identity group, challenged by other people who weren't members of that group, uh, uh, but they could be fed, fed a few scraps of red meat at election time and the conservatives would go on uh, doing free market stuff. Mm. And, uh, now those people, yeah, the 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 tail, the, what was the tail is now wagging the dog. Uh, uh, it's it's the um, it's the pursuit of those uh, those cultural war prejudices which which drive things. The most um, yeah, the most the old style um, uh, right can extract is is tax cuts and and business favours. Uh, yeah, there's really no interest at all, of course, in a program of free market reform anymore. On the left, we had the same kind of story that lots of people weren't really that happy with, uh, weren't really that happy with you know, uh, market reform and so forth with privatisation, uh, but ultimately had no nowhere else to go. That um, you know, preferential system, you could vote for a vote for a, vote for the Greens or some other third party. Your preferences went back to. To labor and to an important extent people never really absorbed the preferential system so so right up to this last yeah you know, i mean as i was going to vote i saw a a, a poster from the labor party saying voting one labor is the only way to get rid of morrison and so i said well that is actually a flat-out lie um you know clearly uh, well in case in fact i managed to elect a greens member of parliament so help but uh, but even if even if you Voted Green, your second preference was distributed to Labor, had exactly the same effect as, as voting for Labor. People didn't really understand that. Um, and similarly, uh, you know, the large swathe of, of sort of mildly liberal opinion that had gone along with liberal, the Liberal Party for many years, so called Teals and so forth. All that I think is, uh, is um, ha has developed here and in lots of other places. And I think we'll see. Uh, we we'll see that centrist, uh, that centrist uh, remnant of liberalism, no longer enough to supply two major parties. Um, uh, you know, it's really, um, uh, it's really being squeezed, uh, squeezed from both ends. Mm. And it uh, sort of picks up on a question that sort of come through a little while ago about you know what what the political strategy is that might produce sufficient uh, support for uh, for paying more tax, John. And it's of course you know we've you know had 30, 40 years now of of um, of competition between major parties about um, who can deliver tax cuts, and of course that's on the table again right now. Uh, you know, what are the ingredients of um, of building that consensus? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, mm. I mean, I don't think we'll see a consensus, but it, I mean, I suppose it's important to look back at 2019, which was a big disappointment, and say, well, um, you look at the number of factors which have been urged as causes, and you conclude there's really too many of them. I mean, clearly. For a bunch of reasons, Bill Shorten wasn't a very popular leader. Um, I don't think much good as Bob Brown has done historically. I don't think he did the left or the Greens any favours uh, in 2019. Uh, the election campaign was appalling. Um, you know, we could eat we, if if Labor had got two percent more votes. Uh, everybody would be talking about uh, as you know, that. Uh, uh, the electorate has been converted to the marvels of high tax. So I think um, I think it's un it's not clear that the um, it's not clear that the uh, task the task of at least securing 
a majority uh, support for uh, for higher taxes uh, uh, is that difficult? I mean, securing consensus perhaps another matter. I guess we'll see. Um, yeah, we, we're now going to see. I guess with the current government, I mean, the as far as can be determined, uh, they're determined to deliver on the state street tax cuts uh, along you know, along with. Uh, uh, reducing debt uh, in an environment which is even less favourable than they might have expected in economic terms. Uh, that's going to be, that is already entailing lots of spending cuts. Um, we'll see whether, uh, yeah, if that turns out to be a successful strategy for the Labor Party, then I think we're out of luck on that front. Uh, my perception, yeah, uh, my perception, I guess, as we know that uh, we know that Twitter isn't Australia, but but. Nonetheless, Twitter is a large segment of engaged left-wing Australia. Uh, I perceive a pretty radical change in mood there in the space of six, six weeks. That um, mm. uh, that uh, people who were enthusiastic about the change of government are all sort of glad Morrison's gone, but not at all happy about what we're seeing. Uh, what we're seeing uh, in terms of continuity of this government with the last one. Uh, how that plays out, I think yeah, there is again a huge element of chance in these things. Two more senators in the two more Democratic senators in the US, and the whole thing will be radically, radically different. So, um, so we just have to hope that. Uh, I think, as I said, I think presenting something, presenting something more than a grab bag of somewhat more left wing alternatives to what what we have is part of it, and that's the idea of utopian visions. John, and on that note, we'll have to end today's seminar. But look, thanks so much from, from me and from everyone uh, listening in today. Really appreciate the questions that people have fed through to us today. Uh, John, looking forward to reading um, your next book. What you got, got another one in the pipeline? Sadly, no. I, wrote, I had one mostly drafted on the economic implications of the pandemic, a takeoff on Keynes, yeah. but the pandemic really moved too fast and mutated too quickly. Uh, <laughs> to, <laughs> <laughs> well, we know we, we we know that we'll see um, things from you published on a regular basis anyway. So yes. thanks uh, very much from from me and everyone here today, and thanks for everyone um, uh, tuning in today. And uh, we'll uh, let you know about the uh, forthcoming uh, seminars over coming months. Thanks, everyone. Great. Okay. Thanks for having me.